Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Symposium 3, Strategies to Address Somatic Health Conditions and Decrease Premature Mortality and Serious Mental Illness. Uh, I'm uh, going to turn this over to the chair of the symposium, Beth McGinty from Johns Hopkins. Hi everyone, I'm just gonna say a quick, quick welcome and give you a overview of what's coming and then hand it off to my colleague, Sachini Bandera. Um, so we have three presentations today. They are all related and they are all focused on Maryland's Medicaid Health Home Program, which is a program formed through the Affordable Care Act Medicaid Health Home Waiver. Maryland has focused it on the population with serious mental illness, and so it's a behavioral health home program focused on integrating primary care services into specialty mental health care settings. And so we have three presentations that are sort of sequentially going to um, break down what we're learning about that topic, starting with an outcomes evaluation, um, followed by the second study, which I will talk about looks at how different types of health home structures and integration parameters influence outcomes, and then um, our final presentation by Dr. Gail Domit will report on some of our qualitative and survey work around implementation barriers and facilitators related to population health management and care coordination. So we hope that you'll have a pretty comprehensive view of, of what we're learning about this program so far by the end, and um, Ben Dress will be our discussant and help us pull it all together, and I'm very excited about um, this panel, and thank you all for being here. With that, I will turn it over. Um, hi everyone, um, thank you for the chance to talk to you today. Um, like Beth said, I'll be presenting an outcomes evaluation of the Maryland Medicaid Health Homes Program. So here we're looking to understand um, the impact of this program on ED and inpatient utilization. Um, and this work is currently in progress, so the results that I'm presenting today are preliminary. Um, I'm not sure if it's happening. The right arrow. That's what I'm pressing. <laughs> uh. Oh, okay. <laughs> um. Well, first, I guess while we wait, I can just do a Beth gave you a. Oh, that's good. Um, oh, yay. Okay. Um, so before I start, I wanted to acknowledge um, this work is being done in a, with a large group of collaborators, including Beth and Gail, as well as some other researchers at Johns Hopkins University um, and elsewhere, and is funded generously by NIMH. Um, so like Beth said, um, all three of us will be discussing the Maryland Medicaid Health Homes Program. So before I dive into the specific study I'm going to present, I'm going to give you just a brief, um, a little bit more uh, in-depth overview of what the actual program is. Um, so like Beth mentioned, in 2010, the Affordable Care Act allowed for states to have enhanced funding to create um, health homes for uh, Medicaid beneficiaries with complex health needs. And states were given leeway to decide how these programs are structured and who, what population they aim to serve. Um, they were, uh, states were allowed to bill for a set of health home services that were in these um, six buckets. So comprehensive care management, care coordination, health promotion, comprehensive transitional care, individual and family support, and referral to community um, and social support. And the federal government gave states two years of enhanced Medicaid matching funds um, to fund these services. Uh, so Maryland, like many other states, chose to create a health home model specifically for individuals with serious mental illness. Um, Maryland's model is unique in that it wasn't housed exclusively in a mental health clinical setting. Instead, um, this health home model is housed in psychiatric rehabilitation programs. Um, so PRPs are sometimes referred to as day programs, um, and they are community-based mental health programs that serve individuals with serious mental illness, and they provide a variety of services, um, including psychosocial rehabilitation, vocational skills development, life skills development, um, and in some cases, supported housing and employment services. Um, 
So when the Health Homes Program was launched, PRPs were already engaged in the coordination of mental health and behavioral health and social services. So what this program did was really bring a financing mechanism that allowed PRPs to now um, bill for the coordination of somatic health services. Um, so this created a unique opportunity for us to look at the integration of somatic, behavioral health, and social service care coordination um, in this program. And so in Maryland, um, every health home is required to have a nurse care manager that oversees the provision of the health home services that I just previously described. Um, and they're also required to have a clinician um, or an NPPA um, as a consultant. And implementation of this program began in October 2013. And as of December 2016, which is our study period, there were about 48 health home sites across the state. So before I launch into the specific study, I think it's important to understand who exactly we're talking about when we talk about the clients um, in our health homes. So of the about approximately 40,000 Medicaid beneficiaries in Maryland who have serious mental illness, approximately 11,000 receive services at, at PRPs. And these are all individuals with serious mental illness and serious functional limitations. And they're generally engaged in some type of outpatient mental health care because um, typically a mental health uh, provider refers them to for PRP services. Um, so PRP participants who were Medicaid beneficiaries were eligible to enroll in the health home program at health home sites. Um, and as of November 2017, about 6,000 individuals have enrolled. Um, so for this specific study that I'm presenting, what we wanted to do was understand what the impact of this program was on emergency department and inpatient utilization. Um, so given the focus on care coordination and health promotion, we hypothesized that there would be a reduction in both ED and inpatient utilization. And given that the financing of this program was directly tied to somatic health care coordination, we anticipated that there would be larger reductions in somatic related utilization events compared to behavioral health or what we're calling non-somatic um, utilizations. Um, and I will say that once, I'll, once I present the results, we found some interesting results um, related to the behavioral health utilization. So we did end up breaking those down even further to mental health and SUD re related utilization events, which I'll describe um, later. <laughs> So um, to answer our research questions, we used Medicaid um, claims data from October 2012 to December 2016. Our analysis period started in October 2013, or the first possible date of enrollment in health homes, and our baseline period was the entire year prior. Um, our sample included individuals with SMI, all of whom received PRP services, ages 21 to 64, and who were continuously enrolled in Medicaid through our entire study period. Um, so that gave us a sample of uh, approximately 10,700 individuals, about 3,100 of whom were enrolled in the Health Homes Program at some point during our study period, and the remaining 7,500 um, who were not enrolled but were receiving PRP services um, during our analysis period. So like I said, we were interested in looking at the effect on ED and inpatient utilization. So our outcomes, the outcomes that we looked at were, the, um, were ED visits and inpatient admissions. And we looked at these at an all-cause level as well as in the subcategories of somatic versus behavioral health utilizations. And then we looked at both the probability of one of these events occurring as well as the number of events occurring. Um, and as far as the exposure, uh, we were interested in both looking at the kind of immediate or short-term effects of um, health home enrollment as well as a more longer-term um, effect or kind of dose relationship of the effect of health home enrollment. So we have two exposures that we're looking at, each were, that were modeled separately in separate um, regression models. So the first, first we looked at a binary indicator of health home enrollment in any given period. So here our data is at the person three month level. We have an indicator of whether someone was enrolled as well as their outcomes for that time period. And then second, we wanted to understand, do these effects change the longer someone is enrolled? So here we're modeling the effect of the length that someone was enrolled um, over the entire study period as well as on their utilization over the entire 39 month study period which gives us a better sense of that dose-response relationship. 
Um, so one of the challenges that we faced when we were doing this analysis was that PRPs were ad adopting the health homes model throughout our study period. And then within the PRPs, individuals had to actively consent to participate. And so they were being enrolled in health homes throughout our study period at different times. Um, so we couldn't really cleanly do a different difference and difference analysis. Um, and more importantly, based on some qualitative work that um, the team had done, we knew that there were characteristics that influenced both whether when someone was enrolled as well as um, their healthcare utilization. So because of this time varying confounding issue, we employed a marginal structural modeling approach um, to answer our questions. And I'm not gonna go into super detail about this methodology, but just the general gist is that it's an extension of the propensity score weighting approach that we've seen used in health policy evaluation, but instead of applying a weight to every single person, we're applying a weight to every single person time point. And this weight incorporates the time varying confounders at that point, as well as their history of treatment and um, confounding variables in periods prior. Um, and this is an approach that's pretty widely used in the medical intervention literature, but it is relatively new in the health services research space. Um, so we included a number of variables in our weights, both time invariant and varying, which I've listed here. Um, and like I said, we had two sets of models um, for our two different exposures. One that looked at the effect of that binary indicator, or any enrollment in health homes, um, adjusting for time, and then the second looked at the effect of the length of enrollment over the entire study period. So hopefully I haven't bored you with <laughs> marginal structural modeling. Um, but here are the, result, the results. Um, so this is an, a table describing the characteristics, the baseline characteristics of our sample. Um, and what we see is that generally those who were enrolled in the health home program were more likely to be older, they're more likely to be male uh, and white. And there are some indications that this population is potentially of higher need than those who are not enrolled in health homes in that they had higher baseline Charlson indices and they had a greater number of inpatient days in the baseline period and they were also more likely to have schizophrenia. Um, but again, we used the weighting approach to try to account for the selection bias and differences between these groups. So these are the results of the models looking at the effect of enrollment in health home on the probability of having um, a utilization event in a given three month period. And what we see is that any enrollment among individuals with SMI is associated with an overall reduction in the probability of having an ED visit. And this is largely, you can see, is driven by a reduction in the probability of having a somatic related ED visit. And we don't see any effect of any enrollment, um, in a, like a short term enrollment, on the, on the probability of having an inpatient admission or on the number of ED or inpatient events that are occurring in any given three months. So next we looked at the um, length of enrollment. So we find that um, the effects from the previous table persist. Long, the longer someone is enrolled in health homes, the more likely they are to have, sorry, the less likely they are to have an ED visit. And um, this again is driven by larger reductions in um, having a somatic related ED visit. We were also really surprised because we, we found in these results that the longer someone was enrolled in health homes, that they were more likely to have um, an inpatient admission. And this was driven by an increase in the probability of having a behavioral health related in inpatient admission. And we didn't see any effect on our count outcomes, but we were pretty surprised by this um, increased probability of inpatient behavioral health admission, so we wanted to break down our outcomes even further and look at how are these affecting mental health versus SUD related um, uh, events. Um, so here what I present is those behavioral health outcomes even further broken down. And what we see is that health homes is associated with differing results but, uh, based on whether a utilization event is mental health related or SUD related. So what we're seeing is that um, any enrollment in health homes in a given three month period is associated with actually an increase um, in having an e the probability of having an ED mental health visit and a decrease in the probability and number of 
inpatient SUD admissions. And these um, effect sizes are statistically significant, but they're, as you can see, very, very small. <laughs> um, so, and again, when we look at the length of enrollment on the behavioral health outcomes, we again see this kind of differing effect in mental health versus SUD related events. We see that longer enrollment is associated with even greater increases in the probability of having an ED mental health visit, as well as now an increase in the probability of having an inpatient mental health visit. And we're seeing that longer enrollment is associated with a decrease in having um, in the number of SUD admissions. So overall, um, in summary, what we find is that health home enrollment is associated with a reduction in the probability of having an ED visit, and this is driven by reductions in the probability of having somatic-related ED visits. Um, but we see that it is associated with an increase in the probability of having um, an ED visit, really mental health visit, or an inpatient mental health visit over time. And it's associated with a decrease in the probability of having an inpatient SUD admission. Uh, so these results should be taken into context of some limitations. Um, we, our data was limited to Medicaid claims data, so we're only looking at services paid for by Medicaid. Um, we also only used primary diagnoses to construct our measures, um, given that many of our episodes did not ha have secondary diagnosis codes. Um, and because we required continuous enrollment, we um, don't look at necessarily the effect of Medicaid expansion, though that might not be as big of an issue in our population of interest. Um, but these limitations aside, uh, this is the first evaluation of a PRP-based health home um, program on healthcare utilization. And we do employ strong controls for uh, time-bearing confounding, which is, was a key threat to our analysis. Um, so given these strengths, we can hypothesize about why some of these effects might be occurring. Um, so we see reductions in somatic ED util utilizations, which is in line with the hypotheses that we put forward and makes sense and gives some indication that maybe the Maryland Medicaid Health Home Program financing mechanism is actually increasing the capacity of PRPs to provide somatic care coordination and prevent some somatic ED visits. Um, but our increases in mental health, ED, and inpatient events suggest that maybe this is occurring at the expense of the work that PRPs were already doing. Um, so we know from our qualitative work that nurse care managers reported um, that they alone were not able to provide all the health home services needed to kind of meet the state requirements per member. Um, so they often relied on existing PRP staff to kind of step in and help provide those services. So potentially what we're seeing is an increase in mental health related inpatient and ED utilization that's demonstrating kind of this shift away from the prior work that PRPs were engaged in. But of course we can't really say for sure with this analysis, these are hypotheses. Um, and again with the SUD findings that were kind of surprising to us as well, we can hypothesize that maybe Health Homes is placing kind of an increased attention on the health homes, provider attention on the health homes population in a time where SUD care is kind of changing and um, kind of readily apparent. Um, but to really understand these results, I think this is, it's important to know that this is kind of just one piece of the puzzle and we hope to expand this work to also look at the effect on outpatient um, utilization because, for example, it'd be important to know, is SUD inpatient utilization decreasing while outpatient SUD utilization is increasing, suggesting that there's maybe a shift towards less intensive care settings, or are we just seeing a decline in um, needed SUD care? Um, but overall, I think the conclusion of the study is that the model is showing some promising results in reducing somatic ED use, um, but perhaps there needs to be some more thinking and resources to ensure that it doesn't come at the expense of um, the work that PRPs were already doing to coordinate mental health um, and SUD care. So I will stop there. Does anybody have clarifying questions for Puccini? We're gonna keep this pretty informal. So we'll have discussion at the end, but if you have clarifying questions, like, go for it. Yeah. One is, uh, 
um, when you show the diagnoses of your cohort, um, is that um, at the encounter um, for wh whichever utilization you're, you're looking at, or is this for the person? So that predominance of schizophrenia, for example. That was for the person. Okay. Yeah. So it was the prevalent, the percentage of the, the percentage of the population that had a diagnosis of schizophrenia, for example. All right. Yeah. And um, was there, or are you looking at any seasonal variation in terms of utilization, um, ED and inpatient, and whether there's any correlation with um, homelessness or housing instability? We haven't done that. No. Okay. Yeah. All right. So a quick question on the inpatient substance use. Um, what I've seen in our local settings, at least in some Midwest, is so, so the inpatient SUD beds haven't really increased, but there's more people that are competing for those beds. Mm -hmm. And so what we've observed, and I wonder if you could tell this from your data, is people with SMI who have SUDs tend not to be as competitive into getting, mm -hmm. getting those beds occupied. So could you look at sort of the SUD inpatient population to see if it's a smaller share of folks with SMI who are occupying those beds. I mean, I would just wonder if that's what we're seeing, is yeah. that somebody with schizophrenia probably is not as likely to get in as somebody with out a primary psychotic yeah. disorder. Yeah, sorry for the crosstalk. We were, we were just thinking about it. It's a great point. Um, we unfortunately can't do that because our data is limited to a cohort of people with SMI, so we don't have the universe of SUD admissions. But if, if we did, it's a great point. I agree. Go ahead. Do we have time? Um, so uh, great presentation. So uh, you, it's it's great that you looked at just enrollment or you know people who haven't been enrolled all the time. Um, you know, given the house homes are you know eligibility includes like you know if you have serious mental illness then you are. And, and they're persistent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you are basically eligible to be enrolled. So I wonder if you know the reasons why people disenroll from health homes. Um, we actually, yeah, we, we do have in our data the reasons. Um, a lot of them are very nonspecific um, and fall into kind of a general other category. But of the specific reasons, a lot of them are people leave the PRPs, actually, um, and are not leaving the health home. Um, they're kind of moving away from their PRP site. I assumed you couldn't clarify that you did IEP, though. Yeah, but I will, I should clarify that in our analysis, um, the analysis that I presented, we adopted an intent to treat um, approach where we assumed that once someone was enrolled, they remained enrolled because we wanted to take a more conservative approach. But our um, kind of next steps are to try to address this disenrollment uh, piece a little bit better because I think you're right, it's an important piece. Right, it's also like chaining, like, you know, do they enroll and then disenroll and then come back? So um, I yeah. guess the dynamics are important. Yeah. Thank you. Any other clarifying questions for Sachini? Yeah, go ahead. I'm wondering if the increase in psychiatric stints uh, that you found a lot of people were enrolled in the program, if that could have been because those assisting in that program were, were helping to identify the need for that better? Yeah. So that yeah, it, it definitely could be, and it's hard to know. I think we were surprised by the results ourselves, and um, yeah, but it definitely could be, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Can we have the McGinty PowerPoint up there? <clears throat> Perfect. Okay, so I am going to build on the research that Sacchini presented. I will do my best to clarify when I am doing something different analytically and sample-wise than what she did. But so the question here, and I'll, I'll go into some more detail, the question here is whether there are specific characteristics of these different health home programs. And by characteristics, I'm really focused on dimensions of behavioral health primary care integration that influence the degree to which different health home sites were able to reduce the ED visits. We're focusing on the ED visit um, outcome that Sacchini just described. 
Again, I want to thank my collaborators, Gail and Sacchini, and especially, um, she's not able to be here today, but Aline Kennedy Hendricks, and that she did a huge amount of work in the early stages of this process to develop these integration parameter measures that I'm going to talk about. And I want to acknowledge funding from NIMH for this work. So the motivation for this is that we have an increasing proliferation of these what I'll call behavioral health home models. And I'm using that term to mean a model in which we are integrating primary care into a specialty mental health setting. So I'm going to use behavioral health home or BHH throughout this presentation to indicate that model. And so we're seeing more and more of these. There are, as Sacchini alluded to, 17 states in D.C. are using the Medicaid Health Home Weaver Program through the Affordable Care Act to implement, implement these types of behavioral health homes. The SAMHSA PBHCI program is a, um, one of the earlier large-scale examples of this type of program, and they're popping up, um, I think, across, across the country. And so we're starting to see some outcomes, evaluations of these types of programs, but there's not very much known about like, what is in that black box of a behavioral health home, right? What does the implementation look like? What do the structures look like? What does the coordination look like? And so that's, that's sort of where I'm going with this particular study. So the goal of you know, different behavioral health homes is, is the same. It's to better integrate primary care services into behavioral specialty mental health settings. And behavioral health home programs typically share some core elements. Right? They have some kind of financing mechanism to allow the specialty mental health programs to get paid for coordinating and or delivering primary care services. They are typically run by a nurse care coordinator who sort of heads up implementation. And there's a lot of similarity in the types of performance measures used across different behavioral health home programs, um, which focus on access to and quality of care and reductions in ED utilization in particular. But there's growing research. We've done some in Maryland, and there's been some nice implementation work around the primary behavioral health care integration program um, by the group at RAND and others um, to sort of describe like, what, what do these programs actually look like. And there's a ton of variation <laughs> in what a behavioral health home looks like on the ground. Some of them have co-located primary care providers. Some of them don't. Some of them have totally shared EMR systems with primary care clinics. Some of them don't. Some of them are partnered with FQHCs and some of them are trying to coordinate primary care with like 50 office-based primary care providers. There's a lot of, sort of differences in what's going on on the ground. So that leads us to ask what exactly is sort of integration of you know, mental health and primary care services in the context of behavioral health homes. And so our team in a prior study started to um, do some of this work by thinking about, well, how might we measure different dimensions of behavioral health primary care integration, particularly in the context of behavioral health home integration. There's been much more work on these concepts in the um, world of primary care medical homes, right, the opposite kind of integration, and certainly some of those concepts are, are relevant here, so it's not as though we're starting from scratch. So to do this, to develop a set of behavioral health homes or what we're calling integration parameters, we used the AHRQ um, integration lexicon, which set forth um, these broad parameters that were very conceptual. They sort of couldn't be operationalized and that you couldn't apply one to a, to a health home site and give it a score in terms of how integrated that it was, but did a very nice job at sort of laying out what are some important or potentially important dimensions of integration. And so we used those dimensions to develop a survey instrument that could actually oper operationalize these different integration parameters. I'm not going to talk a lot about the survey instrument. I'm happy to answer questions, but it's published, um, so feel free to um, find that. Uh, separately. Um, but briefly, it was an 110 item survey that asked like structural questions, right? Does your behavioral health home program do 
X, do you have a co-located primary care provider? If yes, how many days are they co-located? Those kinds of, kinds of questions. Um, and the leader, we asked the behavioral health home programs in Maryland, I'll tell you more about the sample in a second, to identify who is the person that knows the most about your program. It was typically the nurse care manager. A couple of sites thought their health home director was the right person. We let them decide. They filled out this survey, and that's where we got the data from. And in that first paper, we sort of reported different dimensions for a series of measures that I'll introduce you to now. So we had eight different integration parameters. I will tell you more about these as we go through the presentation, but it would take me a whole hour to give you the sort of algorithm that goes into each one of these, although I have them in supplemental slides. So if you're dying to know about number seven or whatever it is, I can show you. Um, but so the general um, parameters that we care about here are the range of care team functions the range of care team expertise, the spatial arrangement of the primary care providers within the behavioral health home, communication information strategies employed by the behavioral health home team, level of consumer engagement protocols, um, degree of access to um, consumer health data, comprehensiveness of shared care plans, and systematic follow-up of consumers. So each of these is a categorical measure. It, between, it has between three and four sort of levels. Um, so I give you the example of spatial arrangement here. The spatial arrangement measure, a site can be rated as having completely separate space. Right? There's no shared space at all with the primary care provider. They have separate space but are within walking distance or provide transportation to primary care provider. Or they're co-located. Right? They're in the same building. Again, if you want the nitty gritty of these definitions, I can give them to you offline. All eight measures are coded so that a higher number indicates a higher level of integration, which will be relevant for interpreting the regressions I'm gonna show you in a few minutes. So in our prior study, what we did is we collected this data from 46 of, at the time we were collecting the data in late 2015, there were 48 operational behavioral health home sites in Maryland. We were able to collect this data on 46 of them. And descriptively found that there was considerable variation on all of those integration measures, except for one, which was number eight, the systematic follow-up measure, where almost all, 87% of the programs reported that they were sort of meeting the highest level of integration in terms of having pretty comprehensive follow-up capacity for behavioral health consumers. And so given that we don't have very much variation across sites on that measure, I am not using it in the analysis I'm about to show you. In our prior study, we also did some exploratory factor analyses to see if these individual dimensions, which again were based on sort of a conceptual framework from SAMHSA, perhaps grouped together in, in some way. And we didn't see much indication of that. So the EFA results didn't indicate that particular sets of parameters were sort of driven by the same underlying latent variables. And so as a result of that, we didn't create like an aggregate integration score based on these measures. There are some other examples of aggregate integration scores out there in the literature. Uh, but given that we were more interested in understanding the specific dimensions of integration and how they might affect outcomes, and we didn't see um, strong evidence of correlation in our factor analysis, we sort of keep each of these as a separate variable. So the research question in the present study is whether these integration parameters influence the Maryland Medicaid Behavioral Health Home Program's effects on emergency department utilization. Right, so just as a recap, you just heard Sacchini's presentation. We found in the outcome study that the Maryland Medicaid program reduced overall um, ED utilization, and that that overall reduction was driven by reductions in somatic utilization. And so here, we're asking questions along the lines of, 
or sites with co-located primary care providers more effective than sites without co-located primary care providers at reducing ED utilization, or sites with greater access to health data more effective at reducing ED utilization, et cetera. That's, that's sort of the line of questioning um, that we're doing here. Okay. So the sample is essentially the same as what you just heard from Sacchini, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here except to highlight the few differences that do exist. Um, so here, we are focusing only on health home participants, right? So we're not using a comparison group in this study. Um, and that's because we don't have data on these integration parameters for the sites at the comparison group. We could assume that it's all zero, right? That nobody has any co-location or nobody has any shared data access at control sites, but that is probably an erroneous <laughs> assumption. Um, and so for now, what we're doing is looking at, we're sort of just comparing health homes with and without um, varying degrees of integration rather than using um, the control group that Sacchini included, although it, we'll probably do this the other way too. So in this study, we have 2,595 consumers. It's a slightly lower number than the sample size in Sacchini's study because we had some consumers that were enrolled in those two behavioral health home programs that we were unable to collect the integration parameter data from, so they fell out. And we have 41 total behavioral health home sites in this study. We actually have integration parameter data for 46, but five of those sites were very small and actually didn't have any consumers that met our continuous enrollment criteria for the sample. And so they are not included in these analyses either. So here we are simply doing a basic sort of pre-post interrupted time series. Again, no comparison group. Um, the same study period you saw before, and just as a reminder, Maryland Behavioral Health Homes first became operational in October 2013, so we have a full year of data in which no health homes are in existence. But sites adopted at different times over that study period, and consumers within sites enrolled at different times over that study period. So Cheney's marginal structural models approach accounted for that variation, um, as does this analytic approach that I'm about to describe. The data is set up at the person three month level, and we use multi-level modeling to account for clustering of consumers within sites and repeated measures, multiple ED visits potentially um, within consumers. So measures, all of which again are constructed at the three month person level. The independent variables, we have an indicator for whether somebody is participating in a behavioral health home, the integration parameters, and then the measure of interest is an interaction term between the behavioral health home indicator and the integration parameter of interest, which it's basically doing a difference in difference, right? It tells us the um, effects of behavioral health home participation on ED utilization in sites with versus without a given level of integration. And the dependent variable here is any overall ED utilization. We did a sensitivity analysis using somatic ED utilization as the outcome um, and results were identical. So I'm just going to present the overall ED utilization results here. Right, and we use a series of covariates, which should look familiar. They are the same set of covariates used in the weighting in the main outcomes analysis that Sacchini presented. We're using multi-level modeling, specifically multi-level mixed effects to generalize linear models. For those of you who use Stata, it's the MEGLM command. We have three level data, as I alluded to on a prior slide, um, and we are doing logistic regression models here with random intercepts at the person and the site levels to account for, again, that three level clustering. We did a series of um, investigations into model fit, including primarily comparisons with fixed effects models, um, and you know, based on AIC, log likelihood, Hosman tests, the random effects models, as we would expect given the clustering, um, had consistently better fit. Okay, so I'm gonna dive right into results here. So given that we have a lot of integration parameters, this is like one table spread over five slides, but it is the result of one regression model, right? So in this model, all of the integration parameters were in there, so we're sort of controlling for different levels of integration and all of the interaction terms were in there. So one model, right? Okay, so what do we find here? 
So the take home from this first slide, which shows two integration parameters, um, the care team functions and the care team expertise, and I'm only showing you the interaction term coefficients here, right? So these are like categorical factorial interactions, and so you're getting each level of interaction. And so what we see is that relative to behavioral health homes um, that lack foundational care team functions, and I will tell you in words what that means on my discussion slide, um, those that have foundational functions were better at reducing ED visits. Interestingly, the sort of higher levels, foundational plus and extended functions, these were care teams that were doing extra things, more than they were required to do by the state. Things like adding in health behavior intervention delivery or coordinating with criminal justice providers, right? Extra stuff. Those that are doing the extra stuff <laughs> do not appear to be um, better at reducing ED visits than those that lacked foundational functions. We see no, no difference in behavioral health home effectiveness on ED utilization um, depending upon the range of care team expertise. Right here, we see that co-location appears to matter, right? So relative to those behavioral health home programs that had completely separate space, which was most of them in Maryland, and if you're curious about the distribution, like what percent of our 41 sites had each of these levels, I can show them to you. I have them in supplemental slides, um, but it would have taken forever to show you every single one, so I'm not doing it here. Um, but most sites in Maryland had completely separate space, right? Co-location is, is expensive. You've got to find some space. You've got to contract with a provider. It's complicated. Um, but it does appear that either having um, separate but connected space, so that transportation is provided or people can walk to the primary care provider, or having um, a co-located primary care provider on site um, facilitated reduction of ED visits in these programs. Right, we saw no effects for the communication and information sharing measure. Right. Access to consumer health data. I think this probably doesn't surprise any of us that having better access to consumers' health data, um, again, sites that had a higher level of access, those with full access essentially had full shared EMRs with primary care providers and um, complete access to primary care provider notes. Um, had a significant effect on ED visits. So sites that had that full access did a better job than sites that didn't at reducing ED visits. And then finally, um, the comprehensiveness of, care, of shared care plans appeared to matter. And I'll, for these significant results that I'm showing you, I'll break down exactly what these different levels mean in just a second. Um, but those with multi-component um, or extended component care plans um, did a better job at reducing ED visits than sites with a no care plan available or a very limited care plan. All right. So in summary, Maryland Medicaid Behavioral Health Homes meeting, we saw four different integration parameters, um, did a sort of better job at reducing emergency department visits than sites that sort of lacked that higher level of integration on those parameters. So care team functions, behavioral health homes with foundational care team functions, which was defined as initial evaluation, regular monitoring, and adjusting of individual care plans um, and performing general population health management tasks for the majority of participants um, had greater reductions in ED visits relative to behavioral health homes lacking those functions. Behavioral health homes with separate but connected or co-located primary care providers had greater reductions in ED visits than behavioral health homes without those connections. Health homes with full access to consumers' health data, here's the definition that I just gave you, had greater reductions in um, emergency department visits relative to health homes without such access. And finally, the shared care plans, health homes with multi-component plans, which was defined as having a care plan that included plans for somatic care, behavioral health services, social services, and participant preferences. 
as well as sites that had extended care plans, which added on top of those things other services like health behavior interventions, um, had greater reductions in ED visits relative to sites that had care plans that didn't include all of these things. All right, so limitations. I'm actually going to start with one that, that didn't make it onto this slide, but I was thinking about it earlier. Um, so one thing that's important to keep in mind here is that we measured these integration parameters at a single point in time. Um, in 2015, late 2015 and early 2016, depending on the site. Now, I think that that overall is reasonable in that this is a very new program in Maryland. The earliest adopting sites started in October 2013, and we didn't want to measure these parameters immediately at implementation because there would have been a whole scale-up period, right, where they, where they hadn't met any of these things. Um, but nonetheless, these integration parameters can, of course, change over time, right? If you have staffing changes, some of these functions might change. And so that is something to think about and um, take into account when you're interpreting our results. In an ideal world, I think we would have these measures you know, sort of on an annual basis. Generalizability of the Maryland Medicaid Behavioral Health, Pro Health Home Program. So as Sacchini mentioned, Maryland is the only state that's implementing this program in the psychiatric rehabilitation program setting as opposed to the outpatient mental health clinic setting. And so, you know, we've been thinking a lot about how does that affect the generalizability of our findings? And I think it certainly does have some implications for generalizability and that these are different places, right? They operate differently. In particular, PRPs are places where many consumers with serious mental illness go multiple times per week. They have um, pretty significant relationships with the staff that work there. It's quite different than, um, you know, perhaps somebody who goes in for medication management at an outpatient mental health clinic once a month or once every two weeks. Um, so those differences are important to consider. Um, on the other hand, um, these integration parameters that we designed um, are things that I think could be applied and were designed to be applied to a variety of specialty behavioral health settings. They were not intended to be psychiatric rehabilitation program specific. And the dimensions that they measure, shared care plans, right, access to health data, co-location, I think are relevant across a whole range of specialty behavioral health settings. Um, but nonetheless, these results are, of course, specific to a PRP-based health home program. So in an ideal world, we would also be able to look at how these different integration parameters are related to outcomes in a clinic behavioral health home. We have a single dependent variable here, right? So future analyses will certainly consider how these integration parameters relate to other care delivery and health and social outcomes. I think it's particularly important in the behavioral health home context to think about how these different integration parameters relate to that primary care access and quality measures, which are sort of the most proximal things that behavioral health home programs are supposed to be um, achieving. And again, as I alluded to at the beginning in this analysis, we did not use a comparison group. We didn't simply plug these parameters into Sacchini's marginal structural models um, because we um, lack sort of these integration measures for such a group. And I'll just conclude very briefly with some potential implications. So this is the first study, to my knowledge, to examine how these types of specific integration parameters um, relate to outcomes of a behavioral health home program. And our preliminary results suggest that several of these parameters are sort of have hypothesis consistent associations with ED visits in this sample. Um, moving forward, once we sort of flesh this work out, I think study results could inform the development and refinement of behavioral health home models as we think about what needs to go into that black box to make them effective. Um, and an integration parameters shown to improve quality of care and consumer health and social outcomes could potentially be incorporated into accreditation standards to um, sort of help that, help that process along. Thank you very much. I will stop there. I want to be conscious of time, but Ed, any quick clarifying questions for me before Gail Domet comes up? Great. Okay. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here. Um, 
Thank you. Oh, wait, I can move this. Okay. So I want to thank Elizabeth Stone, who's in the audience, who did a lot of this work I'm going to talk about with Beth and me. And I want to thank NIMH for their support. The Health Homes work um, that you've heard talk about has been funded, was funded by an R24, um, by my K24 and Beth's uh, Mentored K Award. So I'm going to really talk more about some more qualitative results from interviews that we did focusing on how the Maryland health homes were working. And I'm really going to be, I'm focusing on two issues that other states have found and that we also found in work that was Beth led that was recently published in General Hospital Psychiatry that showed that population health management and care coordination, which are two important features of behavioral health homes, there are a lot of barriers that occur in real life implementation in these two areas. So population health management, what is it? Um, there, there are different definitions, but essentially we think of it as um, something that is addressing needs across a continuum of health states for a specific population by using targeted interventions. There are, is literature on population health management um, that, I've, that I've cited here, and including six core components. Um, I'm not... I mean, so we can, we can look at these population monitoring and identification, health assessment, risk stratification, person-centered person intervention, depending on how much risk someone has, and then um, evaluating the program. But I think that the top definition is kind of the most important, just assess, addressing um, and, then assess, and then providing um, care to targeted individuals based on what they need. And then the other concept we're going to talk about is care coordination, which I think is, you know, I guess maybe more intuitive um, to some of us who are healthcare providers, which is really organizing patient care activities across multiple providers. Now, AHRQ has a definition of care coordination as well um, that's more extensive. Um, so we can think about that one as well as we go through the talk. So our research objectives essentially were to describe organizational capacity to, con to conduct, sorry, population health management and primary care coordination within community mental health programs implementing behavioral health homes in Maryland, and to explore behavioral health home leaders' perception of implementation of population health management and primary care coordination in their own programs. So I think that this is interesting because it's delving into these two really important areas in behavioral health homes. And like Beth and Sacchini mentioned, Maryland is the state that has behavioral health homes in their psychiatric day program. So it's a unique setting. So what kind of health care needs do we see in Maryland's health home population? So this data is actually from the state, but just to give you an example, um, obesity is over 60%, 12% diabetes, and 44% have substance use disorder, 25% current or no, or current or prior criminal justice involvement. So, as we know, a vulnerable population. So, the methods that I'm going to talk about really refer to primary data collection that, as Beth mentioned, was conducted in about a one-year time period. And there were 48 active health home sites that we um, tried to work with. We used a combination of both surveys and semi-structured interviews. As, as Beth described, one leader at each health home site answered specific questions about a lot of details about the structure of the site and the services that were provided. And then in addition, a separate survey 
as part of BASK award um, was distributed to all frontline providers at the site, and they answer questions about their perceptions of health home implementation. And in addition, um, I'm going to present information from semi-structured qualitative interviews that were done with not just the um, identified health home leader, but other health home and implementation leaders at the site. So it could be the director, the nurse case manager, um, and other leaders. So we're going to look at measures of care coordination infrastructure from the leader survey, um, and then we're going to look at, I'll show you qualitative data from the leader's interview about their perceptions of barriers, facilitators, and strategies in the health home model for care coordination and population health management, and then we're going to look at the provider survey as well for their perceptions. So as um, we mentioned, we collected data. We, we had a very high response rate, 46 out of 48 health homes we were able to visit in person in Maryland to get this data. And of those, we got all of the leader surveys, and we had a very high also response rate for the frontline provider survey. And we have a total of 72 interviews. So first, let's look at um, some of the structural characteristics of the health home. Now, some of these variables are um, not dissimilar to um, the backbone of the data that Beth just presented, but essentially we have for formal partnerships between behavioral health homes and primary care providers, so 15% were co-located, and 24% said that they had a formal partnership, even though they were not co-located. 35% reported shared access between behavioral health home and primary care providers for medical records. I'm not sure if I can use this or not. Um, and, you know, again, this is self-reported, but almost half of health home providers said they were sending and receiving consistently changes in participant status to and from the primary care providers, although many did not have any scheduled meetings with the primary care providers about care. So in terms of organizational capacity for implementation of the health homes, this is from the staff. So these results are interesting. So staff are reporting high turnover, low ability of uh, enough staff to meet current client needs, not enough time to spend with clients, um, but are endorsing that one of the main goals of the organization is to use evidence-based practices, and are endorsing that people in the organization think that implementation of evidence-based practice is important and that it's a top priority. However, fewer are endorsing training, that there's enough training, and very few, uh, fewer endorsing um, the budget is enough to attend training, and then very few, um, around 10%, that incentives are related to using evidence-based practices. So let's look at the interviews. I think that these are going to be really um, interesting and, and help us to really delve into what is going on at these behavioral health homes with care coordination and population health management. So if we look at key strategies for care coordination that leaders said, so the key, one of the keys was partnership with primary care providers. So this was the most common one mentioned, so 43 out of 72 endorsed, uh, mentioned informal partnerships, and 33 said formal partnerships. So, and these sub-themes included relationship building, directing people with SMI to specific primary care providers that they thought were particularly well-skilled and warm to people with SMI, standard forms and letters um, for communicating with providers, and actually going with consumers to primary care visits. In terms of formal partnerships, it's interesting. One of the key quotes we, we thought was that it was it allowed people also with SMI to get access not just to the primary care providers, but to the, the medical specialists that they might need, um, which it would be harder to get an appointment except with a formal partnership with a primary care practice, it would be more of an entree. 
when we look at population health management, um, key strategies that the health home leaders said was kind of how they were tracking, how they were trying to tracking to track health and flagging who's, who needs care, and then how they prioritized, how they tried to prioritize individuals that might need more care versus not need more care. So they say, I've been kind of grouping people into two categories. There's one that has a higher acuity of people who have very complex needs, or they're severely medically ill, or they're older, they're going to need placement in some higher level care, and then there are those that maybe have a chronic condition, but they're managing it very well, or it's not that severe, so they're trying, I'll do more preventive or maintenance with that person. So that's how they described strategies that were helping with that. Now let's look to challenges. So challenges, these would be across both care coordination and population health management. Well, a key challenge mentioned by 51 out of 72 leaders is not surprising health IT. So similar to Beth's findings where that was an important factor in health util in acute care utilization outcomes, here they're saying if services are done through an affiliated primary care clinic, I can see radiology, microbiology, but not all of our clients use that clinic, and so it's difficult to get the data I need, like trying to figure out when someone actually had a colonoscopy, because our patient population are not good historians, so that hampers the data. So I think this is really true. Those of us that care for this population, I think that really resonates. We don't always know if someone is remembering when they may have had um, a test done or a lab done or who, what other provider they saw. And then the other really important issues were staffing. So finding the right staff, keeping the right staff, it seems like by the time you've trained them, they're gone, and then you've got to look for someone new. You know, crisis in public mental health care. And something really interesting, um, which I'll expand upon in a moment, is that the idea of the nurse, the nurse in the health home who is a key person to make the whole thing run, they're, they're potential issues with the role of the nurse. So their elite one leader said, I was finding with the nurses that I was interviewing that we can, we can sit here all day long, but they don't want to simply do population health management. It's a rare nurse that wants to do that. They want to bandage things and poke at things. So the idea of a nurse who is used to caring, a clinical nurse who's used to caring for individuals in a bit more like of a reactive way, a clin regular clinical care way, who's now having these roles of tracking and monitoring and planning interventions for like populations with diabetes, hypertension, for example. And then the staffing ratio. So in terms of specific challenges to care coordination, an important thing that was mentioned was that some of the primary care providers, particularly those who were not part of a formal partnership did not have good attitudes. They had negative attitudes about consumers with SMI. And in addition, the health home model in Maryland is set up, so really there's no incentive for primary care providers. The incentive, the positive financial incentive, is all on the behavioral health side. So even though the behavioral health home staff were trying to reach out, um, they, they say, I don't know what I could do for them, primary care providers that they could help me. One of the biggest challenges, they're outside of the organization, they don't have the same team-based incentives. So they might want to do the right thing, but they're not getting incentivized for coordination. When we look at challenges for population health management, as I mentioned before with the nurse role, one of the issue, most important issues that was brought up was that the nurse um, was do, often was doing a lot of direct patient care and not as much kind of populate case management for all the clients that he or she was responsible for. Um, while the nurses that we have are great trained RNs, they were great medical model trained, that doesn't necessarily equate to good trained staff to community work. So the tension between direct clinical care and population, man population health management, lack of health home provider experience, and again, we don't really discuss this here, but there wasn't much training that these staff received. And then, Similarly, another challenge was this issue that um, was mentioned earlier about there was a requirement that everyone in the health home got a, two services per month. So it may be that that individual was pretty healthy and didn't need two services, but for billing purposes to get the per member per month, that was required. So what are some things that would be possible to help? in care coordination and population health management in, in behavioral health homes. So 
these are our ideas, and we'd be, we'd love to hear yours. One of them is creating standard guidelines and protocols, so what, what is truly required um, to, for these, for population health management. And then staff training, I think, is really important. Uh, improvement to health IT, I think, is key. And then thinking about alternative financing mechanisms so that that would both kind of relieve the behavioral health homes of having two member, uh, two services per member per month required, and also potentially um, something for the primary care providers. So our limitations, again, this is only in one state. The data was all self-reported. Mm -hmm. So in summary, I think we can say that there are a lot of barriers to population health management and care coordination in health homes in Maryland, although the staff and leaders seem to think the culture is good. And we, um, we talked about different strategies like partnerships with providers, but there are a lot of challenges with engaging with primary care, staff turnover, tension between clinical care and population health management provider experience, health IT, that we're in the way right now. So in conclusion, to improve these programs, ability to conduct, conduct these tasks, I think we, we need some implementation strategies. So that's what we have. And I guess, Ben, if you want to come and yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I wanted to, to um, I, as I was kind of both reading the slides and then listening to the presentation, um, you know, really kind of interesting and, and great project about a really interesting and great program within Maryland. There were sort of two issues that, that um, kind of overarching issues that, that came to my mind. Um, that I think in some ways encapsulate um, uh, both kind of things that we're thinking about in, in the research world, but then also uh, kind of service delivery and um, improving the, the care for people with serious mental illness. So those are the two that I kind of want to bring into, into relief um, as we um, discuss um, uh, this program. So the first is uh, what is uh, the long-standing tension, um, healthy tension, uh, between uh, medical and social models of how we think about um, uh, serious mental illness and care for people with serious mental illness. This is kind of the, the history of sort of the, the pendulum swing. Um, uh, through the years in terms of uh, the public mental health sector. Uh, and it's one that if you, you know, when you, what's, what's really interesting and unique as, as um, uh, the presenters raised in talking about the Maryland uh, health home model, it's what's, it's what's unique about that program is it's one that, that sort of is, tries to make the integration uh, issue bigger than just sort of medical and mental health, but also says, well, where does this social piece fit in? Um, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a minute um, uh, more. But then the second um, that I think has sort of come up in, in a lot of the discussions today at the meeting and that we're thinking about a lot as a field is the tension between kind of the clinical kind of delivering care really well which is what a lot of our intervention research does. You know, you have, you know, you're, you're, you're focused on internal validity of, you know, doing a, you know, a randomized trial, doing a really good job on, you know, those patients, uh, participants who are enrolled in your subject versus these broader population health issues like what Gail was talking about, which really start getting into issues around, you know, the reach um, of programs, and of course, this this one is you know this uh, uh, presentation today was about really trying to look at a program that's been scaled up across the state, 
Um, I mean, even that is reaching just about 25% of Maryland's SMI population, um, but it's still a lot bigger and, and broader and, and, you know, comes with it the, the, you know, what happens when you kind of release into the wild uh, these programs, you know, try to make them um, uh, move the needle on, um, at a population level. You know, both of these are really important. You know, the statistic that motivates a lot of this work um, and is sort of in the title of this is the um, premature mortality statistic, um, which uh, uh, about a decade ago uh, uh, was kind of highlighted in the uh, report by the National Association of Mental Health Program Directors. Um, that was both uh, in part an impetus for for a lot of um, uh, the um, NIMH's kind of investment um, in this area uh, and, and was also a very important lever in um, kind of policy lever in the Affordable Care Act and part of why mental health kind of had a seat and why health homes, so many of them ended up, um, almost all of them ended up focusing on serious mental illness. But that statistic, you know, we, we, you know, we don't, um, really know why that's the case, like what's causing that mortality gap. We can kind of work backwards. We know if you look at people's death certificates that the proximal causes of death are medical problems. But if you go upstream from that, uh, you start getting into kind of trying to figure out a portion uh, contribution of risk factors like lifestyle factors, smoking, and, and um, uh, of physical inactivity and, and diet and poor medical care. And if you go even farther upstream, you start getting back to all these social, you know, the causes of the causes, the social determinants, um, which, you know, and it's, it's important for two reasons, right, when, when you're thinking sort of in the more public health terms. One is because we kind of think, you know, believe that that probably is contributing to, if you know, a lot of, you know, the, uh, the, the lifestyle factors and poor medical care that, that cause mortality. But also, you know, what public health thinks about isn't, of course, and what we think about, of course, isn't just mortality. It's the area under the curve. It's Dally's or Hallie's. It's like the, the healthy years lived. Um, and what that is about is about maximizing function and health while alive. So. So function, that's why function is really important, and that's why it's really important, you know, for a health home program to be thinking about this issue of kind of, you know, where uh, kind of f function and, and kind of supporting social factors comes in. Um, so the other piece, so the, as I mentioned, you know, um, the, the sort of the, the reason, the health homes, the impetus for the health homes uh, section being the Affordable Care Act in part was, um, you know, kind of a recognition that there are these populations that had a lot of medical morbidity, but they're also, um, you know, as in, you know, kind of hope, kind of buried in a lot of the, the legislation was the hope to be able to contain costs, and that's the main outcome um, uh, that was looked at in these studies was decreasing, you know, um, hopefully through more efficient care on the, on the front end and better coordinated care, being able to um, uh, decrease unnecessary uh, uh, care um, uh, among these sort of high cost, uh, high morbidity populations. And again, as I mentioned, one of, there, there's a lot of variation across all the, the states that are, that are using health homes, but one of the, the common themes based on how the regs were written uh, is they almost all uh, uh, have folks with serious mental illness as a population um, of uh, interest. But um, again, uh, you know, M Maryland is, is kind of a, um, a unique program that built off the backbone of these uh, psychiatric uh, rehab uh, facilities. Um, probably because Maryland already had such a strong um, uh, kind of history and infrastructure, um, and it, it was sort of a natural population uh, to work with. 
Um, what it means is that the program, kind of the center of gravity, I, as, I, as I hear uh, in your presentations of this program, it's a little bit less uh, medical and medicalized than some of the other health home programs, which are focused in community mental health uh, settings, typically. Um, uh, Gail, you would, you would said that um, just something like 15% had co-located primary care. Uh, so, um, you know, in a way, you know, this is, was sort of building off of this, these programs that had very strong uh, psychosocial support um, and then kind of adding in some, some medical care uh, on top of that. So, uh, I mean, just to sort of briefly, just sort of my, what I saw as sort of the really interesting findings from the three presentations, Sashini's, um, you know, kind of, again, this kind of real world, high kind of external validity kind of uh, uh, look across uh, health homes that found um, reduced somatic uh, utilization in the behavioral health home group. Um, you know, interesting and I'm sure will be, will be compelling both within um, uh, to, to, the, to kind of sustaining the program within Maryland. Often it's those cost statistics that sort of get policymakers' attention um, and potentially raise the issue about, you know, kind of how this, um, as I think uh, Beth had raised, how this might generalize to other health home programs. And then Beth's study, which did the really important work, but always challenging work of trying both to unpack sort of this black box and then also to find that, that, that ultimately undefinable concept of integration, which, you know, we all always talk about but are never <laughs> quite able to define. I mean, one of the things I was wondering about in your um, presentation, I mean, integration is sort of one thing, but it's sort of a, a bunch of different things. Um, and one of the things that may have been captured, especially when you're looking at this co-located versus non-co-located, which seems seemed like sort of the bright, brightest line defining some of the programs, is again that issue of just sort of more intensive and more more intensive and more kind of medicalized approach, um, which again may be necessary, particularly. Um, you know, for addressing uh, things like somatic em uh, emergency department needs. Um, and then, you know, Gail just kind of providing that, the, the, that context around the, um, you know, the, the multiple challenges faced um, uh, at baseline, um, again, not just for medical and med mental health care, but also social factors, which, you know, again, gets at that, um, issue that we've been talking about. Um, so, um, you know, I guess from, a, you know, my takeaways from the program, uh, from, from the presentations and from the program more generally, uh, from a research perspective, um, I think it's, it's um, there's a huge amount of value to doing these rigorous evaluations of all of these programs that are that are out kind of in the field now at the community level at the state level um, and they have a, a really you know they're very cost effective they're very timely relative to um, you know uh, a lot of the other kind of work that we do um, and um, I hope this this is kind of a model for for how to do this uh, this kind of program this kind of evaluation really well uh, and I also hope that the results will kind of be plowed back both, um, and, and I'd love to hear more about, you know, maybe we can discuss how they're being used by um, uh, policymakers within Maryland and, and more broadly. And then, you know, from a policy perspective, um, you know, sort of the question is that I think you were all alluding to is, should this model be be scaled? Should this sort of be the model, you know, that that you know, or a main model that's used um, in doing this kind of health home work, um, you know? And there, I, I think it's it's sort of you know, it would be really interesting to hear your guys' thoughts about 
you know, what is sort of unique about Maryland in terms of, again, this, this, this uh, lattice of, of um, psychosocial rehab facilities that it was able to build on if how, you know, you think that would work in, in other places, whether you think that would be a good idea, what you see is kind of, you know, from having really, you know, knowing this program really well, I'd be curious about your thoughts. So those are my uh, brief reflections, and that gives us a few, a few more minutes maybe for questions or um, any more thoughts from you. Thanks, Ben. Questions? Yeah, I have a question. Well, actually, I have two questions. Um, first, um, for your um, Medicaid population, do you know, do you have a sense of how many people have um, dynamic enrollment versus your continuous enrollment that you use for your projects? Yes, although I don't have the numbers on my fingertips. Do you have them, Sachini? The continuous enrollment, this is going to be a little bit rough, but it's between um, 30 and 35 percent of our universe mm -hmm. over that period which is in my experience pretty typical with claims data we have like a five-year continuous mm -hmm. enrollment study it's pretty long yeah. Yeah. yeah you thought it was higher than that okay maybe I'm wrong Gail thought it was higher I think it, I thought it was like I mean in the prior work that we've done like in like a little ten years earlier it was like 80 percent it's a long study period this yeah. time yeah we can, if you want to email us, we can tell you the exact number. I'm sorry. That's okay. I usually go with two year periods, and it's usually it shrinks it down to about half. And so I'm just, you know, over a five year period, I would assume it would be at least that much, if not. Yeah, these guys have less churn than a lot of insured okay. populations because they are eligible by way of disability, right? And so many okay. of them have been eligible for a long period of time and remain eligible. There is still churn, though, due to homelessness and criminal justice involvement and sort of other, other things. But Gail may be right that my, my estimate is I'm remembering too low. Okay. <laughs> then my second question has to go, um, uh, you were using... Um, your studies were in a rehabilitation program. Do you think that your findings on the uh, pieces that were most effective, integration pieces that were most effective, would be applicable in other rehabilitation settings? Uh, maybe not so much in the other type of behavioral clinics, but in other rehab settings, do you think those four things would, would also float to the top as the mo priority things that um, would be most effective in reducing, say, ED um, visits? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a reasonable hypothesis. I don't have a reason to say no, absolutely yeah. not, mm -hmm. right? At the same time, I think context is really important. Yeah. And so it, and it depends a lot with sort of what you're starting with in a given setting and what you're, what you're adding on and what's changing. I guess I, per, you know, this sort of second part of your point, I don't know that I have a good reason to hypothesize that those four things that we found as sort of important integration parameters here would be different in a clinic setting either. Like okay. co-location and comprehensive shared care plans <laughs> seem pretty important to me regardless of yeah. what setting you're talking about. Access to health data, yeah. like these seem like pretty key things mm -hmm. that I would have hypothesized matter in a range of specialty behavioral health settings. But, you know, I'm speculating. We need research in those settings to see. Sure. Sure. <laughs> All right, thank you. Sure. Hi, Susan Asrin at AMH. Thank you for a fabulous set of presentations and, and discussion. Great use of mixed methods. So, quick question. Um, have you done or do you have plans for um, a component involving client perspectives of the, the, the BHH? Yeah. Um, so yes, we, we did um, some, there was sort of a cross between surveys and interviews. So we used a structured instrument. They were administered by a, a study team member. We have about 100, over 100, 115 approximately. We, we used a convenience sample. We sort of didn't have the, the bandwidth to collect consumer level um, data from every single health home. Um, but uh, questions about sort of things like perceptions of access and quality of care, your typical kind of patient reported outcomes types of questions, and we are just sort of digging into that data now. So I don't have I don't have a headline for you, but we do have some. Okay, <laughs> Good question, Marcella Horvitz Landon um, from Rand Corporation, and uh, wonderful presentation. So I have a comment and a question. Um, I guess the comment is 
you seem to be in with that um, survey, you seem, you seem to be hitting at some uh, core elements of clinical integration and organizational integration. And I think you refer to the fact that there's no real financial integration between the primary care and behavioral health settings. Um, and it would be really wonderful to look at how much that adds to, to your results. Um, the, um, the other comment is as a practic practicing psychiatrist, um, I have to say that there's something um, beneficial to my practice when I have a little bit more time because of no-shows. Um, because that allows me to you know, pick up the phone or do uh, get back to people uh, trying to reach me or do that outreach to providers. So I was I was wondering if you could look at um, no-show rates also as an element in your model. Um, and lastly, a uh, question um, whether you would be able to look at uh, a different outcome to integration given that ED utilization Inpatient utilization may be a bit of a blunt uh, outcome, um, and perhaps you know preventable hospitalizations or um, utilization that may be more relevant to what we're trying to to attain. Yes. So I'll take the last question first. So absolutely. So we view ED visits as sort of the first, as you nicely put it, sort of blunt outcome measure. Um, but the you know ambulatory care sensitive hospitalizations and a whole range of um, quality of somatic outpatient care measures are on our list. <laughs> they're, they're in the pipe, they're coming. Um, and so you'll see these same types of analyses um, around those. And I think we'll provide a much more robust picture both in terms of overall outcomes of the program, Sachini's analysis, but also these sort of integration parameter correlations with different outcomes. You know, if, if the ED visits are sort of a blip and are the only place where we see those four parameters mattering, that's a lot less meaningful than if they matter across a whole range of, of different outcomes, I think. The no-show rate is a great point. I don't think we have a way of looking at, at that in claims data, do we? No, because we don't have the, the EMR you know, for each site yeah. to see who was scheduled. Yeah, we would need so the EMR like data, volume. which we don't have. Like volume of how busy each, I don't know, number yeah. of patients per site and number of providers. We control like for this, yeah, we yeah. control for the sort of volume right, yeah. of patients per site. But yeah, I think without the EMRs, we unfortunately can't do a good job with the, the no-show point. Yeah. And the financial incentive is being, yeah. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be interesting. I, I, we did not include that que a question like that on our survey, but I mean, we have a very small sample size, so we probably could. I mean, I, we know, for example, of a couple of at least specific sites that have relationships with their partner FQHC that there's probably some, like Anne Arundel. Um, yeah, right, you has, know, where they, they've that, got they some have financial relationships outside of the behavioral health outside home of the behavioral health home, yeah, but yeah, still relevant. So we could probably that might actually be it's really quick yeah. data to get um, on you know the, those sites to to add. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Thanks, um, Josh Bislop from Rand. Um, it's really great to see uh, work being done on the, what's going on in the laboratories of the states. Um, and it's be really interesting to start pulling together all the things that are going on in different states um, around uh, mental health-based uh, pri uh, primary care, physical care services. It's really great. Um, a question about the characteristics associated with better outcomes. Have you started to think about uh, either ways that those uh, those uh, sort of those clinics or the rehabilitation centers that don't have those characteristics can build those up, addressing what those barriers are, policies that can address those specific gaps, or conversely, whether they should just forget it, that, that you know, if you don't have these capabilities, it's really not uh, really a worthwhile investment. Yeah, it's a great question, and it is, you know, sort of the, I think, the crux of, like, what do we do with this kind of information, right? And so I think that, the answer might differ a little bit for some of the specific parameters. Like co-location is a really hard one. I think, I suspect if you know you got the 
41 leaders of the programs in our sample in the room, they would all agree that having a co-located primary care provider would be optimal, right? Like there, there's no sort of disagreement about the, the fact that that would be good. But it's a huge problem in terms of feasibility. Um, you know, space, they might not have a big enough volume to sort of justify pulling in a primary care provider who's going to say, why would I come sit here two afternoons a week when I'm getting more volume in my practice across town? Like, there's a whole bunch of, of sort of challenges there. Um, and so, you know, I don't know that it's sort of holding them accountable through like an accreditation standard that says you cannot be in a behavioral health, you cannot form a behavioral health home if you don't have a co-located primary care provider. Um, but the we IT would only have like seven sites <laughs> in the state of Maryland yeah. that could do it, right? But the IT. I mean, that is something that But the IT is something that can be incentivized, right? We have examples at the federal level of sort of trying to incentivize EHR through financial rewards, et cetera. I think um, that can be thought about in the context of these programs. And certainly things that are more operational, like the comprehensiveness of care plans that can perhaps be addressed through, you know, some training and capacity building seem like low-hanging fruit in many ways to improve implementation. Great question. Anybody else? Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks very much. This was a great session.